He's given many years of service to the Granite State, and he keeps on giving, now doing what he calls the most impactful work of his professional life. Chief Justice John Broderick has gone up and down the state and spoken to almost 150,000 Granite Staters about the issue of mental health. He has a new book out about his experiences, and he's our guest this morning on Close Up. Thanks for being here, Justice. Adam, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so the book is Back Roads and Highways, My Journey to Discovery on Mental Health. And so you have been all over the place, more than 100,000 miles on your car, talking mostly the young people, I'm curious as we start out here, what do they tell you when they come up to you after these talks and want to you know, discuss heart to heart? Yeah, I wish everyone watching this morning <clears throat> could be with me in those gyms and auditoriums. Um, I speak to the kids for 35 minutes, uh, tell them my own story, my own family's journey and our recovery. Um, and <clears throat> when you're vulnerable to young people, they return the favor. And so oftentimes I'm in the gym another 45 minutes or an hour after I speak. Kids will come up, sometimes they can't even speak. They're so emotional. Uh, sometimes they just thank me for sticking up for kids like them. Oftentimes they open up and talk to me about their own lives, their own problems. And it is so touching to me and impactful. And I ask all these kids, are you getting help? Are you talking to anyone? And half these kids are talking to no one. The, the, the kudo that I want to send out, actually, is to public schools in New Hampshire and New England generally, because I've been all over New England. Uh, the number of counselors that they have in these schools has risen, and that's a good thing. On the other hand, why is that necessary? <laughs> so there's always a dark side to it, but public schools are doing as much as anyone in America for mental health, and, and, uh, and the community mental health centers, obviously, are the center point of all of it. We need to do a better job, Adam. We need to start normalizing the conversation, taking away the stigma and the shame. And then we need to build a mental health system in this country, which we don't have. What is at the root of all of this? I know there can be any number of reasons why people you know, enter into mental health uh, issues or problems, but is there a root cause for young people struggling so much these days? Well, I'm not a clinician, so <laughs> I, I'm always a little leery, but I, I'm a pretty good listener. And I did that professionally for the state on the court, and as a trial lawyer, I listened pretty acutely to what witnesses were saying. I've listened to these kids pretty attentively. Uh, I think a lot of what's bothering these kids is socially and culturally driven. What do I mean by that? Uh, this generation of kids, unlike my generation, uh, is spending six to nine hours a day online. Most of that's not for school, it's this. Uh, this is an alone together generation. There are more iPhones on after midnight in bedrooms in this state than most parents want to acknowledge, and sometimes that's the parents too. We are shortening childhood, in my sense. I benefited from the inefficient use of time growing up. That was not a bad thing. Today, you're on a team, you're on a traveling team, uh, you're in three clubs, you're playing two varsity sports. These kids have no time. And I've heard that over and over and over again. Um, and so I think there's a huge pressure on these kids to succeed. They're scared to death of failing. A lot of high schools, most high schools, Adam, if you have a grade on a given day, it gets posted on a platform and your parents can see it. I asked a boy one night, how do you survive the 65 on the chemistry quiz you weren't expecting? I had a few of those. He said, well, it goes up on the platform. He said, what did you do? I said, well, we didn't have platforms back then, but my memory is that those papers never made it home. <laughs> they got right? stuck. They were stuck in my book. Uh, kids today can't do that. And so I think these kids are amazing, smarter than I was, less judgmental than I was. They also have problems my generation didn't have. It's not their fault. I'm not saying that. But I might be the same. But I, what I want, what I'm asking, is for parents to stop the film, for communities to stop the film, and say, what's happening here? And if you look at the data, it's pretty alarming. Hey, and you mentioned parents, and you know, you mentioned the fact that this started, uh, this journey of yours started with your own family's struggles and your son's struggles. If there was one piece of advice you could give to yourself at the beginning of that journey, and I know what ifing and looking back isn't always great for mental health, but if you could give that advice to parents now, what would it be? What I would say to parents uh, is, first of all, learn what the signs are. 
I'm a baby boomer, not that you could have guessed that, Adam. And so no one talked about it in my childhood. I knew what mental illness was at the extremes, at the insanity level, I could figure that out. But I didn't hear about anxiety or depression or bipolar disorder. Um, I think parents need to educate themselves about mental health, what it is and what it's not. And they have to listen to their children. Um, give an example. I was at a school one day having lunch with eight eighth grade girls mm -hmm. after I spoke. You can imagine how thrilled they were to have lunch with the old guy. So I said to them, hey, I understand your generation is stressed. Is that true? And suddenly they were smiling. I could see the braces. They thought the old guy is pretty smart. So I said, we're so stressed. These are eighth grade girls. I said, yeah, I've heard that. Why is that? Little girl next to me, the best athlete, they told me, boy or girl in the school, she said, I'll tell you why I was stressed. We're always trying to accomplish the next thing so we'll be eligible for the thing after that. And that was not my eighth grade life. And this little girl, by the way, who was a great athlete there, she told me the sport she played. And I said, you must love that sport. Her answer was, well, it takes a lot of my time. Hello? Uh, and I said, well, I suppose you don't have to play. She said, no, I have to play. I'm the best player. They would never let me quit. If I had been able to say to the best athlete in the school that day, you don't have to do that. You can have some free time. She would have hugged me at him. Yeah. And I'm sure in the world she's living in, her parents are rightly proud of her prowess. All her classmates think she's great in sports. That was not the reaction I was expecting. I've hugged football players. I've hugged lacrosse players all over New England who start crying when I'm there, tell me about how they're feeling, how they're fearful of failing. I, I wish we could just slow the film down, talk to our children. And I don't want to sound righteous here because God knows I made mistakes. I was pretty ignorant. But I'm not ignorant now. And I don't think there's a person alive that's done what I've done the last six years because of Dartmouth Health, by the way. Without them, I couldn't be doing this. I have spoken and hugged more kids in New England in gyms and auditoriums on mental health than anyone living. And I've learned some things, and that's why I wrote that book. I'm, I'm not making a dime on the book, by the way, and I wouldn't feel comfortable if I was. But what I would love to do is have parents get the book, read the book, and talk about what's in the book with their own children and their own communities. And I, I think that's the only way what I'm seeing in hugging is going to change. Mm. There's been so much work done to destigmatize the issue of mental health, but I think there's a question that a lot of people, even from my generation, uh, you know, 40s on through, you know, up through there, people think back and say, gosh, in my day, uh, you know, stiff upper lip and all that stuff, and th there was resiliency. We just dealt with it. What is your perspective on that? And obviously, these kids are resilient too. They're just having to deal with a lot more. Well, I think it is different. Uh, I don't think it's, hey, they're not as tough as we were. Oh, these kids are great. I love these kids. If you look at the data points, uh, give me this data point. 2019, before COVID struck, national surveys, well-respected surveys, 46% of high school girls in the United States were depressed. 26% of high school boys, 25% of high school girls had given serious consideration, Adam, to killing themselves in the previous 12 months. 2019, looking back a year, 11.3% of high school girls in that survey had attempted suicide one or more times. That number for New Hampshire, by the way, that year was 8.3% uh, of high school girls. That was not true in my generation. From 2007 to 2017 in our country, the rate of suicide for people ages 10 to 24, the wonder years of life, they should be, the rate of suicide in that decade increased 56%. That's not just happening for no reason. Uh, we need to deal with it in a way that we're not. Now, there are some mental health issues that are, are severe and serious and need inpatient treatment. I'm not belittling those. Uh, but most of what I'm seeing, I think, could be addressed if everyone just took a deep breath, <laughs> exhale, if everyone wasn't busy 24-7. Um, all of these kids that I'm hugging, Adam, have no memory before 9-11. They have no memory at all. The world to them seems chaotic, I think. And the pressure on them to succeed, which is coming from a loving place. Parents love their children as much as ever. 
college is more expensive, athletics seems a route to college or to get financial aid. It usually isn't, by the way. So these kids are trying to jump higher and run faster than my generation ever felt the need to. It comes at a price. I'm hiding the price in schools and gyms all across this region. What needs to change in the government approach to mental health? Well, we don't have a mental health system in the United States. You don't have to trust me. I spoke to the Rosen Carter Chair of Mental Illness at Embry University a year ago, and I asked him how he'd rate the mental health system in the country, one being terrible, 10 being the gold standard. He said, John, I can't answer that. And I said, why is that, doctor? He said, John, we don't have a mental health system in this country. We have fragments, we have a patchwork. If you live on either coast and have money, you'll eventually get help. And it's not because the mental health professionals don't want to be accessible. First of all, there aren't enough of them. There are 28,000 psychiatrists in America. We don't have enough nurse practitioners. We don't have enough mental health counselors. We don't have enough psychologists who are practicing. And so the reason we don't, Adam, we don't have a system that incentivizes people to go into those fields. We don't pay them when they're in there, and we don't reimburse them like we reimburse the doctor who fixes your broken arm. That's a lot of the problem. All right, Chief Justice John Broderick, we always appreciate your time, your perspective, and your work. The book is Backroads and Highways. Uh, I found it on Amazon, actually, so it's out there. Yes, uh, it is. And we thank you for your work and your time, and uh, thanks for joining us. Adam, thanks very much.